The entire idea of Pesach is to relive the experience. And somehow, you know, 33 odd thousand hundred years later, we are supposed to find ways in which we can pay, make Pesach meaningful to us. So not just keywords or themes, but actual um, relevant topics um, in order to make Pesach meaningful. Hence the topic of our discussion tonight of our Raven. I think the, uh, what do you reckon? I think the first, the first thing that comes to mind is, is slavery versus freedom. If you think Pesach, you think freedom, you think slavery. So, you know, how does the world, you tell me, how does the world translate the, world, the word freedom? What, is, what does that mean? I think you said a very good point in the beginning, and that's that, you know, Pesach, as you said, conjures for a lot of people varying emotions, varying feelings. And, and for a lot of us, it, it comes down to often the logistics of it, you know, making sure we got the Seder correct, make sure we got yeah. the house clean. And like you said, often we miss the actual transformation process. And so like, if you could imagine yourself going through like a car wash, you know, if you come in the car wash and out the car wash and your car looks the exact same. That's it's, exactly right. <laughs> it's wasted your money, you know what I mean? So if we, if we enter to Pesach, the same, in the same way that we exit Pesach, then really, what was the point of eating all the matzah and, you know, killing our digestive systems and, you know, yeah. emptying out our bank accounts, not, not a really helpful experience. So like you said, th this whole concept of slavery and freedom, there's a really beautiful story, which I'm sure you, you're familiar with as well, but I thought it was worth sharing, which perhaps, you know, talks to that, that idea, which the famous story of Rabbi May Lau, chief rabbi of Israel, that he was, um, he was once conducting a Seder at, a, at an Air Force base. And a young, you know, young Israeli, I guess a little, you know, Israelis of chutzpah, he came over to Rabbi Lau and he said to him, I have a Sheila, I have a question for you, Rabbi. And he said, what's the Sheila? He says, you know, we say on Pesach, we say, Hashta Avdei, now are we, now we are slaves. L'shana ba, where is Israel? Next year we should be in Israel. He said to Rabbi Lau, he said, I don't feel like I'm a slave. I'm already in Israel. So what's the purpose of this whole exercise? It seems yeah. futile for somebody who's in Israel, who's free. And Rabbi Lau, Rabbi Lau said to the, um, um, said to him, he said, you know, I used to watch some of the Gedolei Israel, some of the great rabbis and sages of Israel. They would cry before Rosh Hashanah and Kippurim, and they would, you know, do vidui and tachnun and, and sort of repent. You'd see them crying. And you'd say, why are these people crying? These are tzaddikim. They're not, they don't sin. So why are they clapping their chest? Why are they acting like they're so sad? There's nothing to be sad about. And he said that the reason they do that is because they were not necessarily crying for themselves. They were crying for other people who may have sinned, who may have been in trouble. And he said, you know, you might be free in Israel right now, but that doesn't mean everybody's in Israel. It doesn't mean, everybody, right. it doesn't mean everybody else is, has it all easy. And so he says, you know, Pesach for you to have an experience um, is really to think and reflect about other people. So, you know, I think Rabbi Sachs once said um, that, uh, he, that I think it was from the Primo, Le um, Primo Levi, he said, you know, how did they know when the Jews were really freed from Auschwitz? He said, when they saw, when they saw that they were sharing bread with one another. When they sort of left that mentality of it's only about me, the selfishness. So slavery, yeah. although, although it's still relevant in parts of the world, although, um, you know, it may seem like a distant thing for us, I think the concepts of slavery are so practical, like what Rabbi Lau was saying, that we sometimes become enslaved to our own ego. It's all about ourselves, all about us. And so Pesach yeah. is supposed to dull those senses of the ego. It's supposed to how am I going to share my life with others? How am I going to share my, the room, the capacity of everything with others? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, very good. Another way of looking at it, perhaps, you know, you ask the question, but Pesach has so many do's and so many don'ts, and we can't eat this and we can't eat that. Where's the freedom in that? You know, is, is that truly, is that truly cheros? Is that truly um, freedom? And the answer, the answer to that really is, what does freedom actually mean? I mean, the world generally translates freedom as, um, you know, a lack of uh, a lack of restrictions or a lack of restraints. So long as I can do whatever it is that I want to do, I'm free. But Judaism doesn't really look at cheros in the, in that way, if you think about it, right. because it's th there's a word for that. When you can do whatever you want, whatever your heart desires, whenever you want, ultimately that's co that's called chaos. It's not called freedom. If everybody just does everything and there's there's no structure and there's no direction and there's no meaning um, and there's no grounding. That's not freedom. So freedom, according to Yiddishkeit, is the ability to express ourselves um, properly, the, the depths of our being. And I think Pesach kind of drills into that. It's that ability for our neshama, our soul to shine and to understand if my soul is not being defined by anybody else, 
then I am, then I am uh, truly free. I don't remember who this uh, example is given by, but the idea about uh, the violin, how, the, how the, um, the strings on the violin are tightly stretched and tightly, uh, tightly wound and are actually you know, pinned down. And somebody could say, oh, just untie them. Let the, let the strings be free. And we all know what happens with that. The strings are free. You don't make music. It's a nasty sound. And sometimes you've got to be structured. You've got to have limitations and restrictions. But so long as they're geared towards the right thing, so long as it, it, makes, it makes beautiful music. And I think when we think about freedom, that's really what Pesach, what Pesach reminds us, the ability for our soul to be able to connect, to be able to fly, to be able to soar, to be able to connect with Torah and mitzvahs, ultimately as Jews. That, is, um, that would be true liberation. That would be true, true cheros. So when we talk about, just to go back to slavery, and you may have touched on this already, Rabbi Raven, um, the idea of reliving the Exodus is to try and find our own Mitzrayim. This is a very famous uh, thought, to find our own limitations, our own restrictions, our own Egypt, and to be able to um, allow our soul to shine, meaning uh, uh, allow ourselves to overcome, so to speak, our own, our own bondage and, and free ourselves that way. And I think that's an exercise that can take more than eight days, but it's the eight days that really puts the emphasis um, the emphasis on on it. So there's lots to talk about freedom, but I think that, that, what you raised is yeah. That's really good because I think that makes it current, and it's it's not just mm. the story of the past. And I, I like what you said about the you know the restrictions. How so, so often we feel that restrictions are actually there to to make our lives worse, but in fact, if we have the right restrictions, and maybe I shouldn't use the word restrictions after the whole whole. No, that's right. <laughs> but, but but boundaries and guidelines. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was a when I was a counselling camp, or even when I was a camper myself. You know, in uh, in South Africa, I remember many years. Like, whenever you had a counsellor who who didn't have control, we just let let you do what you wanted. It was fun for a day. That's um, right. After that, uh, it became chaos, and you didn't enjoy it. But you you wanted that structure. And I think That's you know, right. ultimately, for those people who don't have the true the, the the real sense of freedom, right, and that is being in control of yourself. You, you ultimately become a slave to yourself. And you see people who have desires and temptations and addictions. Yeah. Addictions, yeah. Um, Habits, yeah. Um, someone's asked an interesting question, Shmuel. I don't want to get too sidetracked. But somebody asked, how does that actually tie into the idea of free will? So free will, free will versus having, having you know, a guideline. I think, I think the idea is that Hashem wants us to have the ability to choose. That's the whole concept of free will. Hashem is saying, I need you as a Jewish people to choose this. I don't want you necessarily to feel that you have to do it and you're obligated to do it, which we are. But ultimately, I want you to, to you to choose, and I think that also makes it more valuable. You know, if we were just forced to do it, or if we didn't have a we didn't have a choice, and it was just like we were robots, it wouldn't be so meaningful. Hashem wants us to be the ones that choose Him. Of course, yeah. if you can yeah. really see the choice, there's not much of a choice. If you can really see the value of mitzvot versus a life of without it. Not much of a choice, but in our own senses as a human being, we do absolutely fe feel that free will. But I think what you said as well, just just touching on that um, concept of your own mitzrayim. I don't know who, who did this, but I once heard there was someone, it was some great rabbi, I can't recall, who used to write down before Pesach came in. And maybe this is an exercise all of us can do um, before Pesach. Write down, as Shmuel said, write down a mitzrayim that exists in your life. Whatever, what's holding you back? What is constricting you what is making you feel that you can't progress in life so it might be a particular relationship it might be the way you conduct yourself in a relation it might be something in work something in business it might be you, you you know you're not going for a run you're eating too much whatever your mitzrayim is write it down before pesach and then at the end of pesach maybe look at that piece of paper and say geez have i have i gotten any closer to getting rid of that egypt yeah like i heard someone say once you know egypt and the promised land are not just pieces of geography. They're not just places on a map. They're actually states of mind. You have a, a promised land state of mind and you have an Egypt state, state of mind, a uh, state of being. You can e you're, you're either there or here or in the journey in between. And we know the journey in between and perhaps we can touch on that soon. It took a very long time. It can take a lifetime to get from Egypt to, to your promised land, um, you know, in, in, in your state of, state of being. And that's what life is really all about, to be able to unravel, um, when I say unravel, not in a negative way, but to be able to figure things out to allow your um, your soul to soul to soar. So definitely lots of things to think about freedom. You know, another thing comes to mind. I think I mentioned it at my eldest bar mitzvah, at Yaakov's bar mitzvah. I think it was the it was 
not I think, I know, it was Bishalach. <laughs> we were talking about the Exodus. And I was, I think what my message to him was that there's a big difference between freedom from and freedom to, right? Freedom from, the Jewish people weren't free. You know, yes, the, the police, they, they, you know, Pharaoh let them go. They were free people, but free to do what? So they weren't exactly free. Yes, they were free from Egypt, but they weren't free until they began their journey towards Sinai. So there's a massive difference in life between free from, you know, it's something that's holding you back to free freedom to be able to, uh, to accomplish something as well. And that goes into kind of that journey from Pesach to Shavuot, where not only have we left Egypt, we're not free because we've left Egypt, we're free because now we are able to, um, you know, have direction, have purpose and, and make a difference, make a difference in this world as well. So we can't define freedom just by the fact that we're not being held back by something else. Freedom is very much about now. What am I going to do with my with my freedom, with my uh, with my ability to grow up? I was putting petrol in my car just about an hour before the shiur, and uh, I bumped into somebody I hadn't seen in a while, and I, I was saying to him, "Oh, how are you going?" He's like, "Oh, I'm so happy that we don't have restrictions anymore." And it's in, as as you were saying, as you were saying that that vote right now, it it, made, it struck me literally the second how you know. If your whole entity is about getting away from the restrictions, you only got half the picture, or possibly yeah. not even half the picture, like you said. Yeah. Like, okay, we're free from we're free from Egypt. You know, we've let that go, and it's and of course, in the moment and the time, you want to get rid of that, but that's that shouldn't be the end goal. That I have no mm -hmm. more, that I've gotten out of Egypt. It's now what am I going to do with that, that with that found freedom? What am I going to do? And I think you know, using COVID as the example, I know that so many people that I've spoken to, myself included. You know, you 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 learned you had to appreciate the sense of slavery, and, and appreciate the suffering. Yeah. But as you now get out of it, you want to make sure that you you capitalize on what you experienced. You want to capitalize yeah. on the suffering you went through to utilize it for good. Um, but the problem, Shimon, I want to know what you think of it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I what I had heard recently. But let, let's see if you have any insight. There's, I think, if a lot of people, when you're trying to leave in Egypt, um, a lot of people feel that they're not worthy of leaving Egypt. A lot of people feel that I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it, you know, and, and, and it might not sound so, you know, each of us that are on this, that are, that are watching now, it might not feel necessarily so conscious in your mind. It might yeah. be subconscious, but for some of us, it might feel very real. We might have someone who's always told us we're not good enough. It might be reverberating in, in the back of your mind. Yeah. So I heard a really beautiful insight by the Beit HaLevi. It says that, you know, it says, we say in the Haggadah, we're not, we not we're not going to go through the Haggadah, but says mitchila in the beginning of the avodah zara hayavotein our forefathers were idol worshippers. The question is why do we start? Why are we starting that? Who's that referring to? Who's it referring to? Avram Avinu, Abraham, the person who found God. And the question is why do we begin almost like disparaging to Avraham? But I think what yeah. the Bible says is something beautiful. And that is sometimes whenever we struggle, where we feel that we're not worthy, the say that the, the Pesach is telling us, hold on, and look at the first Jew. What was his background? His background was he himself was an idol worshiper. And yeah. yet he, was to, he was able to achieve so, so much that we, we say his name every single day. And so I think it's, it's very profound. Maybe it's even subconsciously when we read about Avram and we say, hold on, he himself was you know, stooped in idol worship. And yet he was able to find such freedom. But I think everybody deserves to, in a sense, to give themselves a bit of a pat on the back and say, hold on a minute, you deserve this freedom. And you've got to yeah. tell that you're worthy. So I think when, when we start this journey, and like, like you said, it doesn't matter. Maybe I was over-exaggerating. I said you've got to, you know, enter Pesach and exit Pesach, a different person. It doesn't mean you have to yeah. change majorly in eight days. But as long as you get the mindset that I'm now going to try and do things differently, I'm now going to try and be, you know, a different person when I exit this, that I think is the journey. Because you're right, it's, a, it's an entire year worth of, of work and, and, and struggle. Yeah, it could be a life journey. It took, look, it took, it took them 40 years in the desert for Moshe Rabbeinu to turn them into a civil society and to turn them into responsible human beings and contributing human beings. It, it takes time. Um, but that question you raised is a very, very, it's a very powerful one. Um, you know, I, I remember hearing an interesting, perhaps even on the same idea that Yayin, we, we focus a lot on wine or grape juice uh, over the Seder. We have quite a bit of it. And that also alludes to an aspect of liberation, of internal liberation. If you think about wine, first of all, we're taught that nichnas yayin yatsasod, when you consume a wine, you kind of, the secrets come out. Well, that's on, on a very superficial level, we know what that means. But on a deeper level, 
when we internalize the idea of wine, it brings out the depth within us. And when we talk about the depth within us, perhaps again, that's, that, that alludes to that question that was raised, it, it, it brings out our potential about what we could be. Um, and we know that all of us at our, at our deepest core, hopefully we don't have to dig too deep to find it, is good, is positive, is capable, is, is, is a mensch, and so on. So definitely one of the aspects of Pesach is to be able to bring out the sod, bring out that which is really, really deep. And that's definitely a big part of uh, recognizing the potential of who we are as human beings. And we should never, ever, as you say, underestimate ourselves, um, always believe in ourselves. That's a form of, of um, that's a form of liberation in and of, in and of itself. To, right. drink, to drink that wine, to drink that yayin. And it doesn't mean, and I think, you know, we both, we both are, are proponents of, of, of always ensuring that you do take care of yourself, you know, and, you know, it doesn't Absolutely. mean that you might not need professional help. It doesn't mean that you might not need to talk to someone, but I think it's of course. a basic fundamental belief that Judaism sees each of us, the fact that we're still breathing, the fact that we still have life means that Hashem values our existence. And, yeah. and if the creator of the world values your existence, there's no one else who can ever tell you any differently. Yeah. And, as I said, sometimes it's easier said than done. And certainly when someone's going through a struggle and someone's going through a tough time, it's, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be a challenge to believe in yourself. But I think, you know, when you're buying that matzah and you're buying that wine, and maybe if, if everyone's happy to comment, I'd like to know what, what's your favorite kosher wine. Um, <laughs> um, um, you know, when you're buying all that stuff, just remember that there's a purpose to this mission. I think that's really something which, which always strikes me every year. It's like, you, as I said in the beginning, you get so caught up that you forget about this is what it is. Like we've said, two really powerful, we've said already quite a few powerful things to reflect on. Each of them are a life's journey, what we've been talking about. Yeah. But I can. Well done. There's another <laughs> thing I wanted, to talk, I wanted to talk about, and I don't know if, um, if you had any. Daniel, one second. I want to pick you up on your point that you mentioned. Okay. What do you think I, I, the moral perhaps represents? We'll go into the Seder next time, but the, the idea of we put so much focus on the bitterness. And we don't ignore the struggle. You know, you were talking about, yes, a part of this journey is acknowledging the struggle that we, that we all have and each to our own and we all have our own. That we, we look at the moral in the eye, so to speak, and we recognize how the pain, the suffering, the struggle is all part of that journey of liberation. It's not just the wine and the matzo and all the positive stuff. It's, we, we don't ignore the struggles. It's part, of our, it's part of the journey. We look at it and we say, this is the bitterness that we're all experiencing. And it's part, and we take it with us because as human beings, that's how we live. Um, so the moral is a very powerful idea as well. I think you're right. I think, and, and like you said, we will talk about some of it by the Seder, but I think you're right, 100%. This, yeah. whole, this whole conversation that we're having and, and these last few points is crucial to recognize that we don't want to ignore or pretend yeah. that bitterness didn't happen. I was yeah. actually with my wife the other day. She was doing this, uh, just having a little shear with someone and, she meant she, she 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 told me a vote about Miriam, who was the leader of the Jewish woman, really. You know, we all think about Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron. We think about Moses and Aaron, but Miriam, her name, what's her name? Her name contains the word mar, which means bitter. Right. She's, what did she do with that bitterness? She herself experienced the firsthand. She saw the cruelty of the Egyptians. Her own brother was thrown into the, the Nile River. So she, the question is, what did she do with that bitterness? Yeah. So she turned it into empathy. A, for herself, you know, a lot of times we always think about empathy in terms of others. You know, I'm empathetic to another person. I can feel, you know, sometimes we're not so empathetic to ourselves. But yeah, Miriam, absolutely. Miriam was able to, to capitalize on the pain and suffering of herself and to realize that she wasn't going to hide it. In fact, it's part of her name. And I think that's, it's part of her identity. Yeah. Was, was her struggles. So I yeah. think, thank you for bringing that point up. Yeah. It's that constant back and forth, I think, between Matza and Mora, Matza and Mora, Matza and Mora. And that's our story. And we're proud of it. We own it. So the, so the, the other thing I wanted to look at um, was the concept of Imuna, the concept of faith. Mm. You know, we've, spoken, we've spoken a little bit about the idea of freedom, but um, there's a, there was a one, I think it was the boy in a He used to say, you know, we, we know the famous line, adar mar bin when Adar enters, we increase in our joy. I never heard this. I was looking at it today. I saw someone write, Mishanichnas, he used to say, Mishanichnas Nisan, mar bin bemuna. When the month of yeah. Nisan enters, we increase in our faith. I think there's a, there's a whole lot we can just talk about when it comes to Imuna, when it comes to our faith. And um, the question is, when you, when you speak about faith, and maybe we can in, include in that Bitachon, trust, there are sort of two different um, ideas within mm. that scope. But the question is really, 
you know, there's, there, there is an idea that we obviously we have the three matzahs at the Seder, but we also have a fourth matzah that some people have called the Suffolk matzah, right? In case one of the matzahs breaks, a lot of people don't do this tradition. Yeah. I heard one, it was explained, you know, why do we bring the Suffolk matzah? And it was twofold. Number one is obviously that um, you're allowed to bring doubt to the table, right? You're allowed to bring that sometimes I struggle with questions. Yeah. Jews, you know, we have always been the people who is nice. Seven Ishma. We do, yes, we're going to do it, but we, yeah. we might grapple, we might struggle with understanding. So I think Pesach, besides for the whole thing we were talking about before, I think it's also time to try and re, re, re strengthen that commitment, that faith. That, and it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't mean you can't have questions. In fact, yeah. it's created in questions, it's encouraged in our faith. So, like when you think of Emuna, when you think of faith, I don't know what others think, but. Certainly, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Like when you think of Emuna, when you go into the Seder with Emuna, or you're trying to, I don't know, my father in law, and he, he always says, eat more matzah, you get more Emuna from more matzah. Yeah. So I, I think it's not a name to it, right? <laughs> I think that's one, that, that, that's a very yeah. way of getting Emuna. Maybe, maybe you have faith in Hashem when you're on the toilet, I don't know, but from all that matzah. <laughs> but how do we get more Emuna? Shmuel, how does, how does Pesach make you feel like you get more Emuna? So it's a, it's a good it's a good one and it's definitely a highlight um, definitely definitely one of the big themes uh, you talk about emuna and you talk about the concept of hashgacha pratis as a big part of you know divine providence and believing in the concept of divine providence I think if we take a step back you think of it we all very familiar with the ten plagues right the ten plagues that uh, uh, that preceded the liberation that we were referring to that was that commemorating you know it's a very elementary level to think or perhaps a very basic level, uh, not in a negative way, but to think that the only purpose that, the, that God brought the Ten Commandments on the Egyptians was to bring them down. Surely God in all his you know, powerful glory could have found another way to get rid of the Egyptians. Yet it was this methodical um, plague one after the other. Some, some people grouped them into groups of threes and so on, but perhaps even more so than bringing down um, the Egyptians, it was about teaching the Egyptians and the Israelites and the Jewish people a, a lesson. And that is, <laughs> yes, there's a, there's a God in the world. So I think the entire premise of Pesach is, is based upon the fact, a strong reminder that there's somebody pulling the strings, that there, there's a higher power, that there's, there's a God, and one that we put our full, you know, full faith in. The, the name itself, you can say Pesach, was the fact that we believe firmly that Hashem jumped over our houses. Exactly. And then part of that is, is, is a, great, a great amount in Munah. So I think whichever aspect you look at that on Pesach is reaffirming the fact that um, God is all powerful. And ultimately there's um, everything in the divine providence. I, saw, I remember seeing a very interesting thought talking about the plagues that they were grouped into three, as I said before. And each set of three came to teach the Egyptians and the Jews something else when it comes to divine providence. Uh, the first one was to first of all tell them that there's an existence of God. Obviously, uh, Paro and the Egyptians were very against that, but there is a God that was the first three. And um, we can spend a long time on this because why the first three, why the second three and so on. The second three is that not only does God exist, and if we're talking about Emunah, I guess this is what it's all about. Not only does God exist, but he actually runs the world. Um, he actually has control of what's going on. And the third set of three which takes us to plague number nine was all about proving that god is the absolute meaning there's no equal there's no parallel and, and so on makas bakhoros perhaps is in a, a league of its own that god is in charge of life and death so again the entire idea is reaffirming in our own minds and um, even with the suffix like you say even with the doubts and the questions that there is this concept of hashkacha protest that there's you know divine providence that god runs the world and that, and but the, the, the key is, I think, two points. One is like you just said, but we're going back to that questioning. I think everybody that's listening, and certainly we're talking to ourselves too. I mean, this whole conversation is practical for me and you as well. Hundred percent. You know, people mm -hmm. people think rabbis have the answers. The truth is, we probably have more questions than anyone else. There's nothing yes. wrong with having questions. In fact, Hashem, Hashem, because we have our own questions plus everyone else's questions. <laughs> <laughs> right. They, they they pay us to try and have some answers, but you know. Um, yeah. but, we really don't really have many answers, to be honest. We we have just as many questions, and I think I, sh I think there's nothing wrong with questions. There's nothing wrong with sometimes feeling uncertain. Yeah, yeah. He's like he's exactly what you said. It's there to it's there to try and give us like almost like a power surge and say, you know, a power charge rather. You know, here is yeah. here is the ability to plug in and say deep down within you. You know, we say Anachnu ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim. We are believers, the sons of believers. What does that mean? It means 
that there's an intrinsic part of us which has which is almost plugged into the source yeah and that 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 sort of capitalizes and gives you that that power so it is interesting because Pesach is all about questions. You know, we encourage the children to ask. We want that, inqu that inquisitiveness to, to get the forefront. I wanted to share yeah. a story with you, Shmuel, and I want to get your, your thoughts on it, okay? Because it, sure. it blew me away, this story. Two stories. We'll do one at a time. The, the story takes place in the, in the Kovno ghetto. Um, and I don't know what theme it is. I think we're going to we're gonna have to dissect this story because I think it's got a lot of, so many points in it. But in the Kovno ghetto, there was somebody who was caught smuggling flour to make matzah. Now you can imagine, in the ghettos, you know, when you think about Pesach, it's not, they didn't have coals to go and see where they can get the cheapest matzah, right? This was something which we don't even have. I mean, certainly those who, who had parents who were in the Shoah and others who had, who may have been there themselves or, or you know, been children at the time. Um, you know, so what happened was they caught this child or whatever, it was a child at the time, um, but they, they knocked out this young man's teeth. And he went to a rob at the time. There was this rob um, called the rob Oshri. And he came to him and he said to him, Rav, I don't have any teeth anymore. They knocked it out. And so the only way that I can eat the matzah is by soaking it in a little bit of water that I've got. But my minag, my custom when I was back, you know, when the times were normal, was that I didn't have gabrox. So what's gabrox? Gabrox is some have an, an extra stringency on Pesach. They don't mix any of their matzah with any liquid because in case there might be some flour which didn't get cooked or baked, and it now mixes water, it might turn into chametz. And he asked the rob, he said, now that my teeth have been knocked out, can, is it possible for me to have the matzah um, dipped in my water? And I, when I heard the story, I was like, this is just a, a little beyond. But I want to get your initial thoughts, because obviously I've had a, a few minutes to think about it before. I don't know if you've heard the story before or not. Very interesting. Uh, first of all, it tells you how powerful the uh, custom is, how powerful the minig is, especially yeah. when it comes to Pesach. Very often, uh, you know, customs are customs and are very powerful, but sometimes we've got, to, we've got to remember what's a custom and what's a rule and not drive ourselves so much sugar. Um, but yeah, again, I think it goes back on, um, you know, that's what that person remembers, perhaps even goes back to the fact that's what, that, that's what tied him to his childhood. That's what uh, tied that, that individual back to um, his roots. That was, that was the strength of his Yiddishkeit is a very powerful point there. Um, but yeah, that's that's next level. I mean, forget I like about your it. teeth. Let's worry about the brocks, right? I didn't think about I didn't think about the the concept of a minag. I think that's really I mean that's a whole that's a different discussion within the discussion. But you yeah. know, Pesach is about customs. You know, Pesach yeah. is about minag. You know, and it's amazing. I bet you if we asked everybody in this chat, you know, <laughs> minag, we'll see we'll get you know myriad of different answers. You know, this yeah. person this, this person eats that. But I think what I found really powerful about that story was really just the great depth of Jewish faith. You know, yeah. here was a guy who had his teeth knocked out, and yet, what was he worried about? You know, am, am I to doing do Pesach right? Am yeah. I doing Pesach right? And I'm like thinking, where does that come from? Where does that yeah. ability to really just, you know, if you got your teeth knocked out, you'd say, forget about this. I'm, you know, I'm packing up my bags. I'm forget about Judaism. Yet when you hear stories, like, and look, and I'm not saying everybody had such a great ability to do that, but it's just, it's inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. And it all goes back to what we started with, with this idea of freedom. That was his soul, you know, on fire. That was, that was, he was, he was a liberated soul, so to speak. And, it, and like you said, it's, everybody's different. We all have our, you know, the way we connect. Um, Minhagim are powerful, um, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't overwhelm ourselves with, you know, with, all, with perhaps sometimes with things that are extra, but to do, to do what we know is right and to do the best we can when it comes to Pesa. Well, on that note, I think there's a, there's, I think there was a, um, there was a meme going around. I mean, it's it's not it's not a new one for sure, but it's like you know, um, dust is not chametz, and your yes. children, your children are not the Pesach offering. You know, yeah. <laughs> I think some people do go. At times, we forget about the human being. You know, we so we and I'm not saying we shouldn't do like you said. We should do mean hugging. We should do custom. We should be absolutely. Know, we shouldn't. In fact, there was a there's a story um, I heard of of Kron. He's um, I think his his mother. Um, was once at the, at the Seder and they had a guest, this other Rav, who was very makvid, very strict to make sure he ate the afikoman before midnight, you know, and yeah. so rushing through it, rushing through it, and they, t they kept, you know, telling him, just stop, you don't have to rush. And um, so he explained, obviously, that, you know, they landed up taking their time, taking their time, and he landed up eating the afikoman after Pesach, after the midnight. And um, they said, like, why... Um, why didn't you respect my wishes to have it 
before midnight. And he said, <laughs> my mother was, you know, obviously she's a, she was a widow and for her cooking for Pesach was the best thing she can do. Like it gave her a sense of meaning and she spent weeks preparing for Pesach, preparing for the food and <laughs> look forward to hearing the debate Torah from her children and grandchildren. And so he said, to eat the, the, the to eat to eat the um, lafikomen before midnight is a is a rabbinic enactment, but to honor a woman like this, to honor and respect somebody who's put so much effort in, and to see her life, and to give her nachas, that's 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 the, that's a deraita, and I think yeah. we, we we get so caught up in the finer detail that we forget about the other person. You know, so often yep. you you know you rush to 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 do certain mitzvot, and you think in the middle you're trampling on everybody else around you. So I think you're right. I think it's important that you know that you that you pointed out that customs are good, provided they don't have to harm anyone else. Yeah, and important customs are important, like you said, uh, you know. But yeah, um, two very good questions from Basil. The second one, Basil will address uh, next week about the four the four the four sons. So we'll get to that. Um, and the first question we'll get to nearing the end. We're going to do a little bit about um, the process as we have Pesach this year on. Motzei Shabbat Saturday night. Yeah. So, so, so I don't know. Look, you agree. Sometimes we do. Get, we, those customs do infringe on some of our humanity, which is not ideal. True. But it's sometimes those customs that that remind us of home. You know, I haven't done Pesach yeah, for a know, while. Absolutely. And when I do them at home, that that that's what you know. That's 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 who we are. That's what we have. I mean, that's the story of our people. Um, you know, we've been holding on to traditions, but again, not at the expense of somebody else or of your own sanity, really. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we were talking before about the depth of emuna, the depth of, uh, you know, the idea of belief. The, the entire, you know, it's all about miracles, one, one after the other, miracles. Um, what, what, did, what did David Ben-Gurion say? There's a famous line he did in an interview once about Jews. Um, I forgot what he said. I think, oh, in order, to be, in order to be a realist in Israel, you have to believe in miracles. <laughs> in order, right? In order to be a realist, that's what it was. In order to be a realist, you have to believe in miracles. Um, you know, we as we as a people, we just um, yeah, saying that just something just comes to mind now. I don't remember who said this, but again, we could talk about this next time. But the the word seder, um, I'm not going to go into the seder, but just the name. The word seder means means order, right? Because there's an order of things for us to do. But if you think about it for a moment, Pesach is anything but a seder. It's anything but. Um, you know, a predictable series of events. It's all about crazy things happening, seas splitting and 10 plagues and leave, millions of people leaving Egypt. It's anything but a Seder. So why, why do we even call it a Seder? It should be, you know, an evening of miracles or, or whatever it is, why a Seder? So there's a beautiful answer and that is that our order, our Seder is miracles. We just, the way we were born as a people, the way we were forged, the way we were conceived um, was just out of the extraordinary, out of the ordinary. And therefore, um, miracles almost come, as funny as this sounds, as uh, ironic as this sounds, naturally to us, right? So it's that idea of being able to live with, with miracles. As Ben-Gurion says, to be a realist for us is to, is to firmly believe, um, believe in miracles. That's where we came from. That's how we've existed. And that's our future as well. And that it goes back to that emunah. We live in the, we live in the supernatural almost. Yeah. Yeah. But I saw that it's, it's an amazing word. It's an order, but it's an order of miracles. Absolutely. Now Moshe yeah. Rabbeinu Moses, when he when he addressed the Jewish people on the when they were going free, he focused on the messages and he says three times. You know, he says to them, "Tell your children what happened." Right? Yeah. The yeah. Is, why is he saying "Tell your children what happened"? It's like, hold on a minute, we just got free. Were you thinking of, I should tell my children in in fifty years time? You know, like or twenty five years time? Let's talk mm -hmm. about here and now. You're like. Let's spread it now. Why, why was he planning, in a sense, for the future? And I think, I think one of the ideas which really, which really talks to me is that it's very easy to, to get that, that, that feeling of freedom or that instant you know, feeling of, I'm going to change. The question yeah. is, true freedom actually happens when you invest in the next step, and in particular, yeah. when you invest in the next generation. And certainly, yeah. yourself, you know, how many times have you gone to a lecture or to a talk or to a shiur and you, you hear a great word and you're like, ah, I'm inspired, everything's wonderful, or, you know, I'm going to change. You know, a lot of people, I think they say gym memberships, you know, you know <laughs> very successful on after New Year's and then, you know, in February, they've already all cancelled, you know? Yeah. 
So the question is, what Moshe Rabbeinu was telling the Jewish people, he said, you're now free, but you've got to remember this freedom, this excitement is not going to, it's not going to last forever. Yeah. Only if you're going to invest in the next generation, only going to invest in yourself, that's what it's going to be. That's going to be consistent. And, and it seems like we've done that job because here we are talking about Pesach, all these thousands that's right. of years later. That's right. And so I, I guess to, I mean, my question to you, Shmuel, is in your life, you know, when you, when you take on something like what, what makes you, how do you keep it consistent? You know, what, 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 do you have any tricks of the trade? I think you just hit the, you hit the nail on the head by using that word. The, is the answer. answer is consistency. Yeah. Um, consistency, no matter how hard you're going to go or how, you're not, how far, you know, whether you're talking about running or, or whatever it is, it doesn't make a difference what you're going to do. Just do something, um, you know, to, to, to keep that spark, to keep that energy, to keep that inspiration going. It doesn't have to be anything great. It's just the next day you do something. The next day you do something else. And I think consistency is really, really, really what, um, uh, what keeps things going. So when it comes to Pesach, when it comes to leaving our own boundaries, it's the same thing. It's to find an area, find a habit, find a, um, a character trait that perhaps is, is a bit um, um, chametz over matzah. Perhaps we can talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a very uh, delightful character trait or habit. And then to work on it consistently. And it may take 40 years, but it took the Jews 40 years to get to Sinai. Uh, it may take a lifetime. It's consistency. That's well, that would be that would be my answer. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the answer was in the question, but it's also it's also I think about taking small wins, I reckon, as well. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. Because often often people expect success overnight. You know what I mean? I think you know, one yeah. of the things you have to realize is that each day that you wake up and you and you've made a slight improvement or slight change. That itself is a victory, you know. Yep. So, you know, you've got to also take those wins. As the Talmud tells us, to fast them, to As soon as you grab too much, you haven't grabbed anything, you lose anything. So, yeah. exactly. Now, yeah. One other idea I wanted to share with you, and uh, I'm sure you have other things you'd like to say as well. But the, one, there's, there's a minag before Pesach to give what we call maos chitim. Yes. Try and help um, those who don't have money for the chag to try yeah. to be able to buy matzah. And I saw a really beautiful idea by the Vilna Gani. And he says in the Pasuk about eating matzah, it says, it says one Pasuk says, Shivat yamim matzot tochelu, that for seven days you should eat matzah. Mm. But matzot there is spelled with aravav. It's mem tzadik taf. Right. And then there's a second verse, matzot yeachel, matzahs you should be eating, like almost for somebody else. And there it's with the vav. And the question is, why the difference? Why when it says you should eat matzah, it's worth out of having when it says that you should matzah should be eaten almost like giving matzahs to others. So the, the Vulna Gaon says something really beautiful. He says, when it comes to the individual obligation, right, it's it's an out of love because okay, for yourself, you do what you can, you do your best. Yeah. When it comes to the communal obligation, when it comes to making sure everybody else has enough matzah, then it should be enough that they should be satiated. There should be a vav, it should be a complete matzah. Yeah, you shouldn't be skimping on other. I think it's really, I think it's a really powerful lesson just in life that, you know, sometimes we're so inward focused that it's all about as long as I'm taking care of my needs. And we saw some of the ugly things in this regard when I was in the COVID shopping. You know, everybody, you know, yeah. as long as I have enough in my pantry, I'm all good. Let's not worry yeah. about anyone else. Um, but I mean, we did see some of the great nature of people by the bushfires. You know, if people were emptying out their pantry, so we did see sort of a dichotomy of, of, of behaviors, but really it's saying, you know, when you, when it comes to Pesach, it's really a hug that we have to try and ensure that everybody has the ability to celebrate the hug. And I, I think it's, I think it's a very special thing to give my husband to try and if you have the means to help someone else to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a common theme. It's a good point. It's a common theme in Yiddishkeit. Look, we're just coming from Purim. Um, here we are celebrating our, our salvation from almost annihilation. And how do we celebrate? Not so much thinking about ourselves, but we're literally thinking about other people. We yeah. straight away, Mordechai and Esther said, yes, now we've survived. What do you need to do? Go make sure everybody else is okay. Go give them food. Go, go, give, go give tzedakah. And it's the same thing when it, comes to, um, when it comes to Pesach. We've got to make, yes, yes, you've got to make sure what to have on the table. But Moes Chitim is definitely um, to think about others and to ensure that they have as, an, as beautiful Yom Tov as, as you do. I mean, that's as, as Jewish as it gets, really. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think it's, um, I think it's important also in, 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 in regards, I guess, not only is necessary to someone who you don't know, um, I think even within your, even within, without the financial implication of it, I think there's also a spiritual or metaphoric 
concept in, yeah. in your in your life, you know, in your family, in your in your work environment, in your community, you know, that you know, it's about ensuring that everybody has what they need. You know, it's about understanding that each of us have different needs and wants, and it's not only about, you know, does the person have matter? Of course, yeah. you've got to take care of them, but it's really about making sure. I think I think in in terms of chinuch, I think with children, and this is a whole different topic, so I don't want to go into too much, but just to make sure each child has their filling, what they need. You know, that's and, right. Um, that's right. We, we'll talk about it another time. I think there's a whole yeah. Discussion. What about chametz and matzah? Let's talk about chametz and matzah. Okay. All right. You have anything on that? Well, I mean, there's, the, there's the famous there's the famous idea that chametz represents the ego, the the, the ego yeah. person. You know, chametz rises, whereas matzah is flat. Matzah is lechem oni. It's it's more the, the bread of humility. And I think you know, sometimes these terms just you know they they come off our tongues and we sort of they just leave us. But really, you know, ego is is, is a really serious idea. You know, when we when we when we speak about the ego, I think it's about when you're not making room for another person, someone else in your space. It's where it's all focused on the eye. The, yeah. The, and Pesach really comes to dull those senses of the eye and say, hold on a minute. You're actually going to be more successful if you are humble. If you do have the yeah. ability. And it doesn't yeah. mean, but I think, you know, someone says, well, then why don't we have matzah all year round? Someone once asked me and I said, yeah. Question. <laughs> you know, having that ego is healthy if it's done in the correct way. And I think Pesach comes to remind us that the minute the ego gets into a position where it's filling up the room as opposed to a confidence, that's when you need a, that's when you need a Pesach. And I know even within the wording, there's uh, some really fascinating insights. I don't know if you had, if you wanted to talk about that at all. Or... Yeah. But I just want just to carry on your point, perhaps to say that there's not much of a difference between chametz and matzah. The ingredients are basically the same, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of salt. And then here we are, the chametz is somebody who just, you know, is just impressed with their own, you know, magnificence of, of how, how amazing they are. And, and they put other people down, not realizing that they're made up of the exact same ingredients as, as you are. And um, sometimes it just takes, um, you know, to, to be a matzah, to, to, to be a matzah, not to be so o- overblown. I guess that's another, another journey from, from that, slavery to freedom. They're so similar. You're saying it's so easy to fall into the trap of one or the other. Yeah, but sometimes we get so carried away with ourselves. Look at me, look what I can do. Look, but the, and, and you, the way you're treating somebody else, but they're of the same stock. They have the same, they're the same human being. They've got the same soul. Who, are, who am I to put somebody else down where, where, I, where we, we both have the same ingredients? And it's just a, it's just a state of mind where, um, and sadly, sometimes a state of behavior where all of a sudden, um, um, I, you know, I'm inflated, I rise. And, and somebody else is, you know, gets, gets pushed way, down. Maybe in a way, and I think, I know I keep bringing up COVID, but, you know, you've got to learn from your experiences that are happening around you. But yeah. maybe, maybe also, like, eating matzah really brings you back, back down to basics, you know, that ultimately we're all human beings. Ultimately, we all, we all survive on the same food. And so I think, yeah. I think matzah really grounds you and says, hold on a minute, this is it. This is, this is it. You know, you're not going to leave the world with more than anyone else. It's all going to be about how you treat others, what type of mitzvah you do, and I think um, for me, Pesach really just gives you that sense of this is this is this is what life is really about, you know, and makes you focus yeah. on what's more important. Yeah, there's another interesting difference I remember hearing about chametz and matzah, is that it's it's laziness versus enthusiasm. You know, chametz just takes its time. The dough rises. I'll be ready when I'm ready. It's a bit lethargic. It's a bit, you know. Apathetic, you know, slowly, slowly does it. Sometimes that's important, but just to go through life, just, just lazy, um, seeking the path of, you know, least resistance. Um, that's kind of represented by chametz. But when it comes to matzah, you know, matzah has to be baked. Have ever been in? It's, it's chaotic. If you've ever been in a matzah bakery, the whole idea is that move. You've got something to do. Get it, done, get it done now. It's got to be done in the 18 minutes. Once the flour hits the water, it's all about speed. It's all, it's all about enthusiasm. So again, there you have that contrast between living life like chametz. I'll just take my time. I'll get to it when I get to it. Again, there's a time and place for that. But I'm talking about as a, a way of, of, of living life versus, versus matzah, which is all about getting things done. And something needs to be done, you know, do it. Whether it's a mitzvah, whether it's helping somebody, whether it's accomplishing some, something, whether it's productivity. Again, you have that contrast between slowness of chametz and the um alacrity of 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 matzah so there's the summer 
I said so on, much to think about on each of these. Uh, on each no, of these but I, I saw something on on Shabbos which I, I mentioned that Surah Ashley shit, but it's worth repeating. I think um, um, on that note, you know, we we lay in the Shabbos. One verse says Elohei Masecha, Los Haselak. You shouldn't make yeah. molten images for yourself. And then the next pasuk says Ushmatem et Matzot. You should guard the Matzot. You right? Yes. Yeah. And um, the question is why why the correlation of these two verses? You know, why do you have don't make you know idol idols and don't make so there's a beautiful story of somebody who once came to a matzah bakery and he saw the the mashkiach the kosher supervisor shouting at the workers angry with them they weren't working hard enough they weren't doing the right thing and screaming at them and um this rabbi came in and asked the mashkiach said what are you so angry about he said, oh you see these people they're terrible workers they're not doing the job properly so angry with them and he said to them he said to the he said to the mashkiach you know hold on a minute you know you understand that anger is a sense of idol worship. You know, when you when you're angry, it means that you you only believe in yourself, not in God. Yeah. And the Torah tells us what it tells us: don't make a molten image. And then immediately it says about the matzahs. Why the connection? And he says because sometimes people think that you can you can excuse bad behavior for what? For mitzvahs. You know, I'm allowed to be angry. I've got I've got to get the matzahs right. Hold on a minute. But if you if you're becoming angry at a time when you're supposed to be making matzah, then you, you you've almost missed the whole purpose of matzah. That's it. It warns us. Don't don't think that using a mitzvah is an excuse for your bad behavior, for your you treating another human being different in a process. That's right. That's it's right. Really acceptable. And it says it clearly over there. But I think you also see, you know, um, I think you said, you know, being busy and getting up and um, you know, we, we shouldn't pass on the opportunity to to do a mitzvah. Which my yeah. matzot can also be a mitzvot. You know, the Torah doesn't have vows. And just like we rush to make sure that the mitzvahs are or that the matzahs are baked very quickly. We should also ensure that we never miss the opportunity to do something because you know we don't know what's coming tomorrow. Now we only have a few minutes left, so do you think Shmuel we should talk about Pesach this year or? Yeah, we should go through the through the thing, a few of the uh, the pointers being that it's a an interesting year with Shabbos falling out on Erev Pesach. Perhaps start at the beginning. Sunday is Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh Nisan is this, so begins the month of uh, yes. of redemption of freedom. Okay, and so the entire month we don't say Tachlun; it's, it's a it's a joyous month. Sorry. Well, they've got to make sure, okay, the first thing they've got to make sure they got to, and all of us, we've got to make sure we sell our comments and get ready. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Elwood Shul members can go through Shmuel and South Corporate Shul members can go through me and uh, anyone can go through the um, Coach Australia also has a, a sale opportunity. There's many places to sell your comments, but it's very important to do that because uh, you're not supposed to have comments in your possession, obviously, over. Right. Places, so we need to sell the comments that we have. Now, the first major difference is going to be the fast of the firstborn, right? The fast yes. of the firstborn is usually the <laughs> era of Pesach. It's usually on the eve. Yep. This year we're going to do it on Thursday. Now, of course, you can get out of fasting if you're a firstborn by by coming to shul and listening to the conclusion of a tract at Siyum. Um, some yep. even some even allowed to give staka, right? Um, it can even be done by a child. Don't have to be bar. Yeah. Now, someone asked, why do we do it on Thursday as opposed to Friday? Um, and the reason, the reason I think is because you're not supposed to fast on Erev Shabbat. Generally, we don't fast on Friday. That's right. Yeah. Uh, there's only some exceptions. There. Well, I think one fast on Sarah Batavid. But generally, we, if someone didn't do the siyum, they would have to then fast. And we don't want them to fast on, an, on the eve of a Shabbat. Yeah. And now, how late can we sell the Hamid up, up to what point? I believe they, you can sell all the way up until Friday, even up until Shabbat, if you haven't yet sold your Hamid. You can still do that sale, but certainly those who are doing it with me, I want to be organized. So I want it all in by like Wednesday so I can I can enact this. Yeah. And it's important because, to because on Thursday night, Thursday night we're already searching for the chametz. Correct. Yeah. So so tell us a little bit about that. So Thursday night we do as opposed to, of course, Friday night. Right. So two nights before, which means we have to think ahead and any chametz you're going to eat, which you can still eat on Friday and on Shabbat morning obviously has to be put away in a, in a certain place where you know where it is. And, and that's, and, you know, and that's what you're going to eat um, on Shabbos because um, we're going to burn, although we're going to burn the next morning, we're going to burn the chametz the next morning, I think before 1225, um, you can still eat chametz afterwards because Shabbos is, Shabbos is coming. It's Friday night, you have challah. You can join us. We're having a Shabbos dinner for those who don't want yeah. to. You can join us on, at Armadale Bowls Club. There's still some tickets left. Are you doing uh, a side of bowls as well? We're gonna have a, we're gonna have bowls and bowls and beer. Preached uh, was bowls. Yeah. And the question is, do we say so? Shmuel, do we say the brach? We so we say the brach at night. 
even though it's yeah. Martin, we do say the Kol Chamira. We do say the declaration of nullification and best to say it in your a language that you understand. So if you understand Aramaic, you can say it if you understand English. That's right. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, the Kol Chamira that we usually say, um, the prayer that we usually say talking about nullifying and destroying the Chametz when we burn, you actually, if I'm not mistaken, you actually say that one on Shabbos. Yes, yeah, so we get no, so we say it once in the in the that's right Thursday night and Shabbos morning, and then once again on Shabbos morning, and we we on on Friday, um, we what do we do we we burn the chametz on Friday and we try burn it what time we try burn it before twelve twenty five before twelve twenty five exactly, and then of course we're going to Shabbos now on Shabbos morning, we need to finish eating all our chametz. By 11:25 a.m. That's correct. For those of you who are going to shul, I think most shuls will we'll start, start earlier start and early. finish the kiddush earlier. Yeah, have a little kiddush, and maybe at the kiddush there'll be some uh, um, some challah to wash on. Just depends what what the, what your shul's got in plan. In yeah, stock. just lo logistically, when you buy challah for Shabbos, just buy enough for literally Friday night and Shabbos day without without too much left over because you're not going to have much anything to do with it. So by, by a little bit less color than usual, perhaps, or if you know how much you're going to, uh, just to be able to observe the mitzvah of uh, Friday, Lecha Mishnah on Friday night and, and Shabbos day. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Also important before Shabbos, um, it's important that we should get, we should prepare, um, what do you call them? The, the pre-existing, the, the, the big candles in order so you can light, ca light candles, the Pesach candles on Saturday, Matzah Shabbos and Sunday night, um, get that ready before Shabbos as well. So the, the, the big licht. Important yeah, to have that ready. Yeah, because you're going to have to light your um, your yomt of candles from an existing flame. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. So look, the main differences, of course, is just to recap. Thursday night we do the searching this year, as opposed to obviously the night before Pesach. We'll burn the chametz Friday before twelve twenty-five. We can yeah. still eat bread all the way up until. But obviously, as Shmuel said, make sure that you're sort of cognizant of where your bread's going and. Because probably the rest of your house will be clean, so just keep you know a specific amount of challah and chametz you need, uh, and where and where you're going to eat it because you're not going to be able to vacuum really. So maybe eat it outside or in a place or over a disposable yeah. tablecloth, or, or plastic yeah. and, and wrap it and and then discard it afterwards. So just to recap, uh, just a reminder: um, not next Tuesday night, the following Tuesday night after that, we'll be doing part two of this uh, series where we'll talk about the. Um, the Seder and go through some insights of the Haggadah and some of the, the halacha, some of the laws and really yep. just some of the discussion. So Shmuel, it's been a wonderful uh, chat to, to have with you and to go through some of the, and, and we could speak for hours. Um, Beautiful. We did say eight or nine o'clock. So um, I don't know if anyone else had any questions you can post uh, now quickly. Put in the chat, yeah, or on mute. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Rabbi Raven. Thank you, Daniel. My absolute pleasure. And, and thanks for everyone participating on, on Zoom and on Facebook. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's really nice to see you guys and to, to have you join us. It, uh, otherwise, it would just be me talking to Shmuel, which we wouldn't have. We, we don't we do that anyway. <laughs> uh, but it is, nice, it is nice to have your company um, and some of the questions that were asked. And thank you, Mark Curran, for telling me that your, your favorite wine is Barkan. Yes. <laughs> I should get a bottle of Barkan for the Seder. And um, yeah, we just wish you a a great lead up to Pesach and just hopefully take some of those words we said about, you know, utilizing the time, not just for shopping and hopefully you find good deals, but for really just saying, how, how am I going to make this Pesach a little bit more meaningful, a little bit more interesting, and hopefully we've given you some insight for that. So have a wonderful Absolutely. evening. And Thank you all. Have a good night. We shall see you in two weeks' time. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Um, Okay, should we end the meeting? Yep. Yeah. Have a good All night. the best, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.